So welcome everyone to our webinar tonight. We are thrilled to have you here with us. Um, we had a lot of new names that actually registered for the event tonight. So if this is your first time with us, welcome and thank you for joining. So before I introduce Nancy, I just have a couple, just like a few slides, I promise. Um, first off, I wanted to actually thank our members for the gift of their membership um, tonight. Um, because of your support, it kind of makes us not kind of, but it makes it possible for us all to be here tonight um, to help provide programming as a resource to our community. So if you're one of those new folks here this evening, consider um, becoming a member with us so that we can continue to delight, illuminate, and promote lifelong learning in our South Bay community. And it has actually, we do miss seeing everybody at the museum for our monthly events, um, but doing our online events has kind of enabled us to cover some new topics and meet new people. And then tonight, I also kind of wanted to remember Elder Julia Bogani, who recently passed away, unfortunately. Julia was a profound advocate for her community with countless accomplishments that were recognized worldwide. Um, we were really lucky that she was able to visit with generations of her most of each students over the years. Her kindness and passion for education will definitely live on in the lives changed by her presence. Um, I wanted to kind of mention this now, actually, because it was Julia who inspired many of us at the museum to kind of embark on a mission to learn more about the abalone as well as some of our um, native marine wildlife. Um, these creatures were at the center of her stories, um, her history, um, and the legacy of her people. Uh, and you can actually see in these photos um, on the on the tables, she would bring in shells. And I, I actually didn't know there were so many different species of abalone in existence until she came and told the stories and talked about the shells and everything. Um, so I wanted, definitely wanted to remember her this evening. All right, and real quick, I'm gonna introduce our fantastic presenter. Tonight, we are thrilled to be joined by Captain Nancy Crusoe. I just absolutely love it. Captain Nancy is a marine biologist and founder of Get Inspired. One of their many programs aimed at involving and engaging their community in science is their ocean restoration program. Through this program, Nancy and her team restored the kelp forest of Orange County after being gone for two decades. And now they're working on restoring green abalone, white sea bass, and pismo clams. So thank you, Nancy, so much for being here tonight. I'm gonna go ahead and stop my screen share and you can go ahead and take it away and I'll be here to pop on with questions. Can you see that? Yes. Okay, very good. Let me um, get that going. Oh, and we already have a question. Have you um, done any diving around Santa Rosa Island? <laughs> oh, you're muted, Nancy. Okay, sorry. Um, I've dove Santa Rosa Island just once. Beautiful place, and it was really cold. <laughs> Beautiful kelp forest as well. Okay, should I go ahead and get started? Yes, absolutely. Take it away. Okay. It's all yours. Very good. Thank you so much for having me. And um, again, if you have any questions uh, throughout the presentation, feel free to interrupt me. I'm, I'm kind of going to do free form and storytelling and, and share some pictures with you. So um, you're welcome to ask questions. And thank you for attending to listen to my story. Um, I'm a marine biologist and I'm a boat captain. I'm a, a U.S. Coast Guard captain. Uh, in the merchant marine. So I'm not a military captain, but I salute all of you who have served our country as, as such. Uh, I'm the founder of Get Inspired, which is a nonprofit organization that's based here in Orange County. And uh, I have my website here on the screen as well as my email address, but I'll put that up again at the end if you'd like to get in touch with me for any reason. I love to hear stories. Um, as you know, history is extremely important or else we forget. And um, a lot of the things I'm going to talk to you about tonight the restoration work I've done, we've forgotten um, uh, how how abundant some of these animals once were. So I love to hear stories about um, people and their remembrances of pismo clams and abalone and swimming in the kelp forest. So I would love to talk with you uh, if you have any stories to share. Okay. 
now I can't, but there we go. All right. I've been a marine biologist for 26 years. Um, I grew up in Virginia. I went to college in Florida. Um, I went to Mississippi to work in the aquaculture industry. I actually majored in marine biology and aquaculture. And um, so I went to work in the catfish business for a few years. I then worked in Michigan on a coral farm. Yes, you heard that right. In Michigan on a coral farm. It was the first one in the country. And that was back in the mid 90s. Then I moved out here to California. I sold equipment to catfish farmers and fish farmers up and down the West Coast. And then I became the water chemist for the Aquarium of the Pacific. Um, then I became um, a biologist for the Orange County Coast Keeper, in which I started a kelp restoration project. I got laid off from there. I took the project to the Aquarium of the Pacific and kept going with the project. Then I got laid off from there. And I finally decided I'm going to start my own organization because I can lay myself off just as easily as they can lay me off. So, uh, but essentially I've been dedicated to learning and exploring science and nature my whole life life. It's my mission statement. And I love to share that with other people. So I do a lot of outreach and teaching, as you'll see. Our mission at Get Inspired is to inspire stewardship and curiosity for the natural world through the exploration of science. And um, it was my fourth grade teacher in Alexandria, Virginia, who inspired me to be a marine biologist. I had never even seen the ocean yet. And Mrs. May uh, taught me about oceanography. And I finally contacted her a few years ago. I had been looking for her for a long time, but she has a very common name. But I found her in Southern Virginia and told her of what her impact on me. And she said she taught that lesson because she had always wanted to be an oceanographer and was not able to do so. So she thought she could inspire an oceanographer. And she did. So Mrs. May and I stay in contact with one another. And I love to share my accomplishments with her because all of it is because of her, everything that I've been able to do. Uh, so teaching and education are paramount to my experience um, as a scientist, because it was a teacher who got me to where I am today. Um, Get Inspired has um, worked in over 40 schools. Um, about 12,000 students have been involved in our programs. And I'm just going to share three of them with you tonight, just to give you some, chew some things to chew on. Maybe you have never heard of some of these things. But uh, again, I majored in aquaculture and marine biology. So aquaponics is something that I love to teach. I am a a farmer. That's what I consider myself. Um, a scientist, a farmer. I farm my, my own property here in Garden Grove, um, but I'm also an ocean farmer. And so I, I'm a 100% proponent of aquaculture. Um, I believe in it wholeheartedly, um, of course, sustainably as well as we can. And we have to put money into it in order to learn how to do that. But um, aquaponics is something I learned in school and also working at Epcot Center center after I graduated from college, uh, where they grow fish and crops in the same vat of water. And you can grow anything from herbs to apple trees in water. And most gardeners would shy away from putting that much water around the roots. But if the water is aerated, it's okay. And of course, the fish provide the fertilizer in the form of poop for the plants to grow. So it's a lovely teaching tool, but it's also a great way to grow food vertically in any space because you can artificially light and um, it uses 90% less water than growing food in the ground. So in places like Orange County and LA County, where we don't have a lot of space to grow anymore, this is a way to get two crops, protein, your fish, and of course, vegetables and herbs and fruits as well. So I teach this um, to students. And uh, um, as you're probably aware, we kind of become disconnected from food. So I was really, really freaked out a little bit the first year I taught it. I have the students building the, the, the systems, of course, and then uh, and taking care of the fish and the plants. And there's lots of chemistry involved, lots of biology involved. And they were afraid to eat the food because it didn't come out of plastic bags. So I had to laugh at that. But aquaponics is um, can be done a thousand different ways. And if you go down that rabbit hole on YouTube, you'll never come out. So before you go down the rabbit hole, um, have a goal because you could spend three years learning about aquaponics. But it's, it's pretty simple. And again, you get two crops out of it. 
but growing food where we live is something I'm very passionate about. And growing your own food, I think, is a basic uh, human need. We need to know how to grow our own food. So I do this. Here's one in a classroom. Uh, these kids were growing enough lettuce to eat salads every single week in their classroom. And they would take turns bringing croutons and, and uh, salad dressing in. I, and I just designed a new aquaponics greenhouse for Orange Coast College. They're going to be teaching aquaponics as a career technical uh, certificates because you can have a business in your own yard, in your garage, growing food. I'm going to be starting a program over on Catalina Island. I told the teachers over there in the school, there's no reason that any lettuce or herbs should ever be imported from the mainland to Catalina because you guys can be growing it. Um, on any rooftop, on any little piece of land that you've got over here. So we're going to work on that over in Catalina and get those kids over there to be able to stay on the island and not have to work on zip lines or uh, at attractions to have a job. We can create some scientists over there on Catalina. Um, and the next program I'll tell you about is called Science Expeditions. And this one was um, actually created with a science teacher friend of mine because of AP classes. AP science classes are required to do field work. And a lot of teachers didn't know how to do field work because they weren't scientists. So I started designing trips um, to go out and learn ecology and geology as well as marine biology. I'm a naturalist as well as a marine biologist. And um, particularly, I've studied the areas of Southern California and also Alaska. Believe it or not, I've spent uh, nine summers in Alaska uh, working as a substitute in naturalist for Carnival Cruise Lines. And um, I, I, I hope that Sutter and his wife, Bonnie, are on the call tonight. So that's where I've met them. Uh, but I've, I've been able to spend a lot of time in Alaska and learn a lot about the ecology and geology and biology um, in Alaska as well. But I put together lots of different trips to teach these uh, field courses for kids to get outside and put their hands in dirt and hands in water and climb and repel and climb trees and figure out board feet of sequoias and and of course diving research diving I teach students how to conduct research in the kelp forests i've even had students publish their own papers before they graduate high school becoming published authors and these guys right here um, are all now scientists um, this is when they were sophomores in high school the one in the middle just got married and graduated med school as a doctor uh, there's one of my Alaska trips up on um, the Ruth Glacier in Alaska uh, I also have taken groups down to Baja to swim with the world's largest fish to study the Sea of Cortez which is one of my favorite places in the world and of course, um, group, I take groups down every year, except for this year. This is the first time in nine years that I haven't been down to Baja to go and hug the gray whales. Um, but I sent hugs down with someone else. But every year I take groups down there to hug the gray whales. If you're not familiar with this, watch it on Hulhauser, California's gold. Uh, but the gray whales migrate past California every year to three lagoons in Baja. And for reasons unknown, they uh, are very interested in humans and, and, let, and come over to encounter them on purpose. It's uh, unexplained, but magical. And I'm happy to share any information with you about that. I'm planning a trip for next year right now to go down to Baja to do that. Hug the kiss the whales. And the third trip of our project I'm going to explain tonight is the ocean restoration projects, which uh, I enjoy thoroughly and I love to share. And it will focus on a lot of the history um, that we're going to talk about tonight. And the, the the idea behind these projects are that people only protect what they love and they only love what they understand. So to explain to people what kelp is, uh, you would say it's an algae, but that doesn't really evoke a lot of love. <laughs> so I had to work really hard to get people to love kelp uh, when I was doing a kelp restoration project. That included lots of art, music, song, poetry, lots of photographs and visuals, drawings, paintings, um, live de demonstrations in the kelp forest. I, I pretty much came up with a, every way you can get people to love kelp. And of course, when I say I, I'm the only person that works for Get Inspired, but I have thousands of people who help me, uh, all of my volunteers, including the kids who were actually in charge of putting on our kelp fests, which I'll get to in just a moment. So 
we were uh, restored giant kelp forests of Orange County. Um, we have been working on restoring white sea bass and green abalone. And now I'm working towards the future of possibly pink abalone, but also pismo clams. And again, I love to hear stories if you have them about any of these species, because that's where um, a lot of my data comes from. A lot of stories that have not been recorded in science. Um, they're actually quite interesting to, to add to my data collection. The goals of this project are to educate students about aquaculture and kelp forest ecology, to involve the community, as you can see all of my projects involve the community, and to create ocean stewards and to restore species to our coast. Um, this is the student there on the left-hand side, she's now a rocket scientist. And she was one of my students to publish a paper in high school as well. So proud of her, Samantha. And she's working for SpaceX. Yay. All right. Aquaculture. I do aquaculture for education and restoration. So I've carried my marine biology and aquaculture degrees all the way through to the work I'm doing right now involving growing things in water and restoring them in the ocean. And also for food, right? The, the aquaponics is also aquaculture. So this is one of the white sea bass systems that we have at Warner Middle School in Westminster, California. The first project I'm going to talk about is the kelp forest restoration project. Now, Los Angeles County has been doing kelp restoration for Oh, 50 years uh, since the 1960s when Dr. Wheeler North started restoring kelp off of Palos Verdes. I had the pleasure of meeting Dr. North um, before he passed away. I would take him to lunch every chance I got and just listen to him tell me interesting stories uh, so that I could learn from his years and years of wisdom because, of course, he published research, but there was so much more in his head that he had to share. So I was really happy about that. Now, luckily, our knowledge of kelp forests goes back to even before Wheeler North, but back to 1913. Actually, 1911 was when these data were collected. Um, during the war, World War I, um, we were dependent on, at the time, we were dependent on um, other countries, um, notably South America and some other countries, for um, for, for potash, essentially, for making bombs and making ammunitions. And so we started to uh, map out the California kelp beds because we could burn the kelp and make potash to, to create ammunition. So luckily, we have maps going all the way back to 1911 that show our um, the kelp forest densities from the Oregon border all the way down through Baja, actually through central Baja. And you can look this up online. There was a really good article about it. Um, I think in Smithsonian magazine a couple of years ago, but the entire series of maps is available. So in 2000, I got involved in kelp forest restoration. The California department of fish and wildlife reported that 80% of the kelp forest had disappeared in Southern California, and it had been gone for almost 20 years at that point. Um, Orange County had lost 90% of its kelp forests. And this was a, this was kind of a disaster. You know, if you imagine going up to Big Bear and all the trees laying on their sides, um, I, I had continuously heard stories about, you know, when I was younger, I used to fish tuna off the Newport Pier, and now we can't catch a sea bass. So I heard the stories of the results of the kelp forest being gone, but um, nobody was really talking about the kelp. And so I got hired on to do this project to start the restoration of the kelp forest. And it was a federally funded project. Luckily, it took place uh, along the whole coast. But why did it disappear? Well, it, to, to collapse an ecosystem, it takes a lot of stresses. And so the one of the, the things that contributed to the collapse was turbidity. Um, you know, we essentially in the 50s, we took over Southern California's coast, right? We paved over streets and sidewalks and parking lots and school playgrounds. And so all of the water now was draining right into the ocean, not percolating surfaces. And, um, you know, there's a, a woman in Long Beach, um, Dorothy, who was diving in the 1940s and 50s. Um, and during the depression as a child, she was free diving in Long Beach before there was a harbor. And she would tell me how clear the water used to be. Well, now, um, and we have records saying that kelp forests used to grow out in 110 feet of water. That doesn't happen anymore. And that's, that's because 
we have a lot of runoff. Um, the water's murky. That's what turbidity means. So the higher turbidity means the water's a little more murky. The sun doesn't get to the bottom of the ocean as deep as it used to. And baby kelp actually starts off its life microscopically. So it needs sunlight on the bottom. One of the first things that happened actually was 1884, the last sea otter was killed in Southern California. So this had to have contributed to um, an increase in these guys because sea otters help to control the population of sea urchins. And sea urchins are these spiny critters that love to eat kelp. And when I came on the scene in, in 2002 to start doing kelp restoration, all we had on our reefs was, oops, there we go. All we had on our reefs were sea urchins. So the reefs looked like this. So uh, that was the first order of business was to get rid of the sea urchins. Now, the last thing that happened was the El Nino of 1983. And this is a, a picture of um, down in San Diego uh, where there was kelp, you know, piled six feet high on the beaches. So the kelp was already waning. I can look at the historical records. Luckily, there's been aerial surveys because of Dr. Wheeler North of kelp forests since the 1960s. So I can look at the surveys over time and see from the 60s to 1983, the kelp forests were dwindling and uh, by 2000, 80% gone. And this El Nino of 1983, if you were here, I was not, but I've read all the stories and talked to everybody. It was enormous, the biggest in um, recorded history with waves coming over some of the, the piers. Um, so these, these big storms uh, pulled out the remaining kelp beds and it simply never recovered. So we started a project in Southern California with four counties involved. I headed up the Orange County restoration effort and it was funded from 2002 to 2008. And uh, I kept the project going through those different layoffs, as I said, as I kept losing my job um, and then starting to get inspired. I kept it going till 2012 when the Marine Life Protection Act went into effect and I was no longer able to do restoration. And we'll get to that part later. Um, and then in Los Angeles County, the Bay found, well, the, the Santa Monica Baykeeper was the original founder of the kelp restoration project. Then it became the LA Waterkeeper. And now the Bay Foundation has been keeping it going uh, under the direction of Tom Ford um, and the Bay Foundation. So here in Orange County, I trained uh, 287 volunteer divers to go out and dive with me. We were diving three days a week for 10 years to remove all these sea urchins one at a time. And we, we actually were not allowed to kill them. We had to relocate them and, uh, and then plant kelp. So I had kids in the classrooms, 5,000 kids growing kelp. And um, then we would go out and plant it in the ocean. This is the very technical piece of equipment we use to grow the kelp in the classrooms. Uh, it's a mostly rubber made containers with a refrigeration unit. Um, but we, we were able to grow the kelp on these, uh, the kids would clean them, get all the stuff off the kelp and get them to release their spores. And we grow them on very technical pieces of equipment, uh, bathroom tiles. So you could see the little half inch strip of bathroom tile. Um, you can imagine when I would go to the tile store and ask for bisque tiles and could they cut them in half inch strips? And they'd say, well, what for? Well, I'm restoring a kelp forest. Okay. All right. So uh, it worked. Uh, after 10 years of removing all these urchins, we literally picked up over a million and a half of urchins one at a time. And um, we were required to relocate them to similar habitat, which what meant wet to me. And we did give them uh, relocation counseling. So in case you're wondering, they did well after that, but we, we were successful. And it was a requirement for all, all of my projects, always the students must go out in the public and teach what they're learning from me in their year long classroom program. So the kids go out and do lots of outreach. Of course, this has not happened in the last year, but I hope, let's hope that we can go back to school next year and be relatively normal again next school year. But another 50,000 people educated from the students by going out and doing these events. And um, I'll, I'm going to tell you this quick story because Jamie's background has a picture of a, an old black and white picture of the beach with kelp strewn all over it. Yeah, there we go. 
And I said, that's so interesting because we don't do that anymore, right? You don't really see, unless you go up to Northern California or Oregon, you don't see kelp strewn across the beach unless, you know, it happened so fast, we didn't get a chance to clean it up. And that's exactly what happened in Laguna Beach after we'd worked seven years at trying to get the kelp restored. And and then it it came back, it reached the surface, and we had a big, giant swell, south swell, over Labor Day weekend. Um, 2009. And the city council called me the weekend after and said, Nancy, we had the worst Labor Day weekend in Laguna Beach history. The businesses, all their business was down. Everybody lost money. And it was because your kelp was on the beach and you're going to have to explain it. And I would went, what? So I had to go and stand in front of the city council. I remember they hadn't had to clean it up for over 25 years. Oh my gosh, how dare you? How dare you? (laughs) (laughs) So they didn't have it in their budget to clean it up. And and Laguna Beach is pretty small. I'll give that to them. But um, they they blamed the kelp for the what became the biggest recession in modern history (laughs) that they didn't know that at the time. Uh, But I realized that I had forgotten to educate one segment of this community. And that was the people who lived in the, that coastal community. I had all the kids in school. Uh, so we decided to put on a kelp fest and the kelp fest, um, other than the COVID is still going on. Um, it became, uh, the mission was to inspire, um, a, and foster an appreciation for the kelp force return because everybody had forgotten that they were important and that we needed them. And so we did you can see there's mostly kids there, um, interpretive dance, lots of art, um, paintings, drawings, chalk drawings, every way you can possibly think of to celebrate kelp. We tried. And again, lots of visuals, lots of artwork, because it's hard to make people love seaweed. I'm sure if I asked you all to raise your hands, most of you probably wouldn't love seaweed, but hopefully some of you would. Uh, Now there's a new threat to the kelp, unfortunately. Um, We have an invasive species that's kind of taken hold on our reefs and it looks like this. It's called Sargassum horneri. That's what it looks like on the left when it's just beginning its life stages in the uh, late summer. And it's an annual, so it grows um, till about now. Uh, It looks like the picture on the right all through the winter, which unfortunately is the time when our kelp reproduces and is looking for a place to land on the reef. And of course, if you were trying to find a place to get on the reef, you wouldn't because there isn't any space. But the sargassum um, came in in the ballast of a ship in the port of Los Angeles and has invaded all five Channel Islands, including Catalina and from from Monterey, was found last year in Monterey, all the way through central Baja, California. It is um, a new threat and um, nobody's doing anything about it. So I'm trying to do something about it. The Department of Fish and Wildlife, however, is not allowing me to remove it from marine protected areas. More on that. Okay, white sea bass is the second species I started working on after the kelp. Um, This was easy. Um, I didn't mention it took seven different permits annually to plant the kelp in the ocean. I had to lease the land from the state of California to plant the kelp on. I had to do permits as if I was building a hotel on the beach, Um, had to get permits from the Navy, um, any of the cities, any of the state parks, the counties, the State Lands Commission, the um, Army Corps of Engineers required to give me permits to do that work. Um, this one was easy because Hub Sea World Research Institute had already gone through all that, and they were releasing white sea bass for the last 22 years. Um, this is a program that's run by volunteers. Maybe you've seen it in the harbors. There's one up in Marina del Rey where they have a pen. They have aquaculture pen there, and they, they actually get them to spawn down in San Diego at their lab. They bring the little fingerlings up and put them in the pens. We have one here in Newport and one in Dana Point. And um, they raise them. The, the anglers actually feed them and care for them. And they grow really fast. So in about six months, they're about eight inches long and they can be released. And of course, that's to help the population because it's a very favorite of anglers to catch white sea bass. They're really tasty. And so I went to Hub Sea World and said, I would like to do this in classrooms. I'm really good at teaching kids to grow stuff. And so they said, great, when you have money, 
to build the systems, let us know and we'll give you the fish. So I went um, to Huntington Beach High School and we wrote a grant to the Toyota Foundation and that spawned the beginning of our white sea bass in the classroom program. So this is a system that I built at Huntington Beach. There are now 11 schools growing white sea bass in Southern California. The kids get to grow, aren't they cute? Ah, I miss them. I hope they can come back soon. Uh, about 4,000 kids have grown white sea bass. We release them twice a year at Christmas break and at the end of the school year. And now we've released over 2,000 fish. But there's some students releasing their fish. And I actually got some students who went through my research diving class and we released them underwater for the first time in the 22 years of the program's history. Um, and that's funny to watch them. They didn't know what to do because it was a really big aquarium. They'd never been in, in water that, that, that vast. Um, this is Orange Coast College releasing their white sea bass. And um, it's always a fun day. We get to go to the beach. Uh, third species that I've been working on is the green abalone. And I, the abalone always evokes emotion, which I love because as everyone who ate abalone, it's, it's like making tamales or eating crab where I came from eating crab. It's not something you just grab out of the refrigerator and eat. It requires lots of steps and preparation. So there's always a lot of emotion that comes from people talking about abalone, which is wonderful for storytelling. And so if you have any, let me know. But I decided to restore green abalone. And at the time, there was actually a farm raising green abalone up in Goleta, California, and they also raised red abalone. So abalone aquaculture was not a brand new thing. I didn't have to figure it out from the very beginning. My plan was to get the abalone, put them in the classroom, teach kids because they did never they'd never even seen abalone before, didn't even know what the word was. Teach kids about abalone and kelp forest ecology and then release them in the ocean. Well, by the time I got the permits, which took me three years of fighting with the state of California to do abalone restoration, um, I was the first one to ask for permission in 25 years. So I had permit number 001. Uh, no one was growing them anymore by the time I got my permit. So I had to start all over from square one. What is an abalone? Well, if you're not familiar, it looks kind of like a rock uh, on the outside. You would not even notice it if you were underwater because they're so good at camouflage. But on the inside, they're very well known. Uh, most people know their shells or a piece of their shell because they've got buttons on their shirts that are made from abalone. And um, we, we ate them all, essentially. They're gone. And it's not because of their beautiful shells, but because they taste good and they're a snail, right? They don't swim away from their predators fast. They just hold on. And we have tools. So a crowbar can get you an abalone. And that's what we did. So most people, again, are very familiar with the shells, uh, but they are actually found all over the world. 57 different species grow around the world and everywhere they are found, they are threatened or endangered or in decline because they're a snail and they taste good. Uh, so that's unfortunate for the abalone. But in a lot of places where they're very heavily fished, they also raise them on farms. Um, if you've ever been to Kona, Hawaii, there's actually an aquaculture abalone farm there. Uh, they do a lot of aquaculture in the energy park, which is just south of uh, Kailua Kona. Actually, it's just north of Kailua Kona. Um, but all of these countries raise abalone for food. And the United States... We had four farms um, in California. We now have three farms in California and we provide food. We, we export it to China and we also grow it here for local consumption. We're very lucky because California has seven species of abalone. They range all the way up to Alaska, but we have seven of them down here. And um, all seven, unfortunately, are in some various stages of decline. It is now illegal to take any abalone out of the ocean in the state of California for any reason. Um, I'm on the state committee which governs the recreational fishery and we closed that fishery in 2017. And that's because all of the kelp forests in Northern California have collapsed. So um, in short, I started that restoration project as well in 2018. And it's 
now got some funding and it's off the ground, but it's going to be a long haul. Um, lots of fisheries have collapsed up there because they don't have any kelp on 600 miles of coastline. So uh, this is what all seven species of abalone look like. Uh, they, again, they look like rocks, unless you know what you're looking for. It's very difficult to tell the difference between them. Um, and there's a few species that I've never seen alive. So it, even if I saw a flat abalone or a white abalone, which I've never seen in the wild, I would probably not know what I was looking at. And, and you have to have a trained eye to figure it out. Uh, but essentially, if you don't know about the abalone, um, I'd like to give a little background because um, we used to have a lot of them. I mean, this is a picture from the 1930s of a processing plant in San Pedro. Uh, and this is a pile of shells, right? They had a lot of shells. They were processing the meat. And this is a, also a Santa Barbara processing plant. Lots and lots of shells processing the meat. Um, this is one of my favorite pictures because the black abalone, all the abalone live in different zones in the ocean. So none of them really competed with each other. And the black abalone was the first marine invertebrate to be listed as an endangered species. And this picture, as you can see, all those little white dots are black abalone, which is now an endangered species. This was taken in 1920 in Laguna Beach, where you literally had to walk on top of the abalone to get to the ocean. Now, I've been looking for them for the last 20 years, and I've only found three in my whole life <laughs> in the last 20 years. Uh, this, is, this is the one that usually gets to the kids, right? Because the kid doesn't even know what the word abalone is. But this is is a restaurant and there were so many shells just laying around Los Angeles. This restaurant covered its roof and walls in 50,000 abalone shells. That's how many abalone shells we had just laying around because we harvested them. Um, these are really old pictures, but this is a picture of a Chinese abalone drying camp. Now, if you think for a second, uh, about our coast. And if you've ever been down to Baja, you'll probably recall we have places called China Beach and China Cove. There's actually several of them along the coast and in Baja. And the reason that they're called that was because the abalone um, was such a prized uh, resource in China when the Chinese uh, railroad workers got to California and saw so many abalone, they they saw a resource untapped because the people in California weren't eating them yet. This was back, actually the, the Chinese abalone camp started in the late 1800s, 1880. Um, in 1913, a biologist went to Congress in Washington, DC and said, if we continue to harvest the abalone like this, we're gonna run out. And nobody did anything about it. But the United States government realized <laughs> that they were not, not getting tax money from this export. And in the 1920s, they kicked the Chinese out of California to stop the export of abalone. But millions and millions and millions of pounds of abalone were shipped out dried. Here's some more pictures, just covered with abalone. These aren't in the shells, remember, it's just the meat. Hey, Nancy, um, yeah. are there any ways to combat abalone withering syndrome? Are you gonna talk about that later? No, I'll talk about it now. Um, <laughs> The, the withering syndrome is now endemic. So the, the, the bacteria that causes withering syndrome is in every single abalone in the ocean. Um, I did a study on that from Catalina all the way up to Santa Barbara and um, Orange County, I mean, down to San Diego County. We published that in 2013. And uh, all of the wild abalone have this bacteria. It is when they are stressed that they succumb to it. So there's no way of getting rid of withering syndrome. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> the height of the abalone industry was 1950 to 1960. Uh, 44 million pounds of abalone were harvested during that time. And um, in Southern California, it's been illegal to harvest since 1997. I just want to, because you're all interested in history, I just want to tell you about this book that just came out last year. Um, I'm on page 254. <laughs> but this is the history of abalone. And it goes back to the 1500s um, abalone here in California. It is 
absolutely mesmerizing how we over and over and over again do the same thing. If you're historians, you know that. But this the abalone is a great example, essentially in a human lifetime, how we continuously just keep beating on something and expecting a different result. Um, I highly recommend this book if abalone interests you whatsoever. And you can get it on smile.amazon.com. If you don't know about Amazon Smile, side note, you can actually pick a charity to get money every time you buy something on Amazon. Just they just give us money automatically, uh, 0.05% of your purchase. If you, if you sign up on smile.amazon.com and you can choose any charity you want. Little side note there. Uh, so as I said, it's illegal to take abalone for commercial sale in the United States anywhere now. Um, and in the world, as I said, everything is in decline. So uh, a friend of mine started the Surfing Heritage Museum, and I've known him and his family for about 20 years. And I remembered him telling me a story when I first met him because I was starting the abalone project about a little happening, a social happening that used to take place here in Orange County. And it was not the same. It wasn't called an ab feed in every part of California. But here in Orange County, um, the surfers and the watermen, the lifeguards, the skin divers um, all hung out at the beach and they would go out on their long boards and collect abalone and lobsters and stack them up and bring them ashore. And then there would be this little social gathering where I come from. That's called a, a clam bake or a lot or a crab boil. But here in Orange County, it was called an ab feed. And I don't know if you had something up in Hermosa Beach. I looked into the history. You definitely would could get abalone off PV very regularly, but I haven't found a historical notation that gave it a name. Um, but here, actually, this bottom picture in the center, that's actually a a, a a stove, an oven that's in Dana Point. It's still there, the cobblestone oven built into the side of the cliffs. And so the, the watermen would bring in the abalone and the lobster and you just congregate, you know, as the process of taking the abalone out of the shell, pounding it to death. Well, it's actually already dead, but pounding it, smacking it, tenderizing it, slicing it, uh, and then cooking it. And there was actually songs created around the process of preparing abalone. Jack London uh, wrote about these songs up in Big Sur. Um, the abalone song, if you get a chance, Google it. Uh, it, it is quite, there's, there's verses and everybody would pass the verses around as they pounded abalone. But these are pictures of our Orange County ab feeds. And I thought, I called him up about three years ago and I said, I want to have an ab feed. We need to re bring back that history that we've lost uh, because it's completely gone from our society. Nobody can take abalone. Anybody under 40 doesn't even know what they what they are. And he said, that's a great idea. So we did. In 2018, the bottom right hand corner, I had the very first abalone since, I don't know, since at least the 1980s when we when we had lots of abalone to take. And I invited lots of historians and old timers to come and talk about their stories of diving for abalone. And then, of course, we bought abalone from the abalone farm up in Goleta and we ate it so everybody could taste it. And that first year I looked around on the beach there as we were lighting the bonfire and I said, this is awesome. But we're all old. We already know these things. So the next year, as you can see the picture in the middle there and the one on the left, I was I made sure to invite college students and young people and get kids there because they will never know those stories if they don't hear them from the people who lived during that time. So the ab feed was canceled last year. I'm in the process right now of trying to plan it for this year, this summer um, at, in Dana Point. So if you'd like to be invited, please let me know by email and I'll be sure to put you on the list. So as I said, aquaculture now provides us with abalone. You can get, this is from Carlsbad Aqua Farms, which no longer grows abalone, but they're right on PCH in uh, San Diego County. Um, there's a, a farm up in Goleta, California, which is where I keep all my abalone. This is the farm in Kona, Hawaii that grows abalone. This is a closer up view. And my goal is to create the largest collaborative effort to save a species in Southern California waters, engaging children and the public. So I have 
um, facilities that have to get permitted, a two-year permitting process, Orange Coast College, Ocean Institute, Pennington Marine Lab, California Science Center, Concordia University, all are permitted to help me grow abalone. And then I'm allowed to put them in classrooms. So I've had um, about 10,000 students grow abalone with me in their classroom for the school year. And um, I hope to have 36,000 kids overall by the end of this project. Abalone grow really slow, unfortunately. Um, a legal size abalone was probably about 20 years old. So those shells you have in your house are pretty um, historical and they're, they're important carbon sources. That carbon is being held from our atmosphere, which dis dissolved into the ocean. And now it's in that shell. It's very important. Oh, don't so tell me that. I have abalone shells from uh, some that my dad uh, back in, I think it was probably the 60s when you could grab them by hand in PV. Um, yes. They're just sitting outdoors. Um. No, well, that no, keep them indoors to keep the <laughs> shell together. We I'm want that carbon to stay in there. <laughs> I'm going to go get them right after yes, this. <laughs> go get them. Uh, so here's some of the pictures of kids uh, growing in the abalone in their classrooms. An abalone anatomy lesson. And so we didn't have school this year. There's the abalone nurseries all dried up waiting for next year. So this year, this school year, I talk about things in school years. We focused on sex, which is good during the pandemic. I'm sure a lot of people focused on sex, but we focused on eggs and sperm from abalone. And we were able to get a very successful spawn last September. I have tried spawning about 13 times in the last 10 years, and I've been successful three times. Um, you can only do it a couple of times a year. And sometimes you're just not successful. They don't want to do it. If they don't want to, you can't make them. Uh, but this is what they look like. They actually hatch out of eggs. When the, when the sperm fertilizes the egg, they hatch after a day. Um, on day eight, they don't even look like abalone. They're microscopic. They're the, they're 200 microns, which is tiny, tiny, tiny. You have to see them through a microscope. And they're just plankton floating around in the ocean for about a month. So everything and everybody is eating them. And now I have 10,000 of them growing on the farm up in Goleta. You see that little one with the red circle around it? That's how big my smallest ones are. My biggest ones are about three inches long. Those are four years old. So I've been at this for quite some time. The the goal, because I published a study on this, is to get them as big as possible because the smaller you are, uh, smaller abalone you are, the more predators you have in the ocean. Everything eats baby abalone. So if I were to put out a thousand of these small abalone, I'd probably maybe get one of them to survive. So if I was lucky. So the big, the bigger they are, um, I got 40% survival when the smallest one was six inches long. So that's what I'm waiting for is for them to get big. And that's going to take a while. I told my husband, this is going to take the rest of my life. So hold on. Uh, next, that's, that's the abalone project, by the way. My next project, I've started working on this, is the Pismo clam. And I am collecting stories actively on Pismo clams because we know nothing about them. You would think uh, after, you know, being a person, a commercial fishery or recreational fishery and everybody taking them and eating them for so long, we would know something about them, but they just didn't get enough money. I guess like the abalone was so um, was able to command so much money. Mm -hmm. We learned a lot about them, but um, we ran out. We ate them all just like the abalone used to be plentiful. People would go out on family trips on weekends to go clamming, uh, but they just have not returned. And again, kids don't even know that there is such thing as a Pismo clam. So I was out actually collecting, looking for some, and a, a surfer said, hey, what are you doing? Because I was measuring a clam. I had just free dove down and found one. And, and I said, well, I'm looking for Pismo clams. And he goes, I didn't know we had any. And I said, well, that's because your grandparents ate them all. <laughs> he said, that sucks. Uh, <laughs> so uh, most kids don't even know we have such a thing, um, which might be good for the clams. Maybe we'll have a generational pause and let them come back. But really, there haven't been a, a clam collecting, you know, activity um, since the 80s, from what I can gather. So I'm looking for places where people collected clams, um, where there still might be clams, because I'm trying to study the populations that are left. And then nobody knows anything about how to take care of them. Where do they live? Um, I'm finding 
you know, do we still have them subtitling? How do we keep them in captivity? How do you feed them? What kind of um, light do they need? What kind of currents do they need? What temperatures do they need? Uh, how much food? What kind of food? So much to learn. And of course, we know nothing about their reproduction. How do you do that in the in captivity? So lots and lots to learn. So if you have stories, please share. Um, I have a lot to learn. And most of it's going to come from people who've messed around with them, played with them, seen things, uh, and, and explored the clams. So all of that being said, uh, I often have questions on how people can get involved. So I have an email list um, just to keep people updated on what's going on. Um, you can come out and help me. I've got programs going on from the inner title out to diving. I'm diving every week. Um, I have a boat down here in Newport um, through a boat club that I've joined. You can report poaching. Um, po poaching is rampant in Southern California. Um, I found some abalone shells last year. If you take a look at the shells here, you'll see these knife marks on them. Um, abalone don't make knife marks on their shells. Uh, this was done by a poacher. And of course, they don't take the shell. They only take the meat because the shell is too big and bulky. But um, you can report poaching to Caltip. There's a phone number there. Uh, but call your local... Um, agency and tell them when there's people taking abalone. Uh, as you saw, poaching was rampant last year in the tide pools, and it really needs to get under control. And the only way that that can happen is if we report it, because then the state knows that we need more money for more wardens. So yeah, that we don't have enough wardens right now. But if we report it over and over again, hopefully that money will be allocated for more uh, management. And Nancy, have you or are you collaborating with the Californian Fish and Wildlife Department to help protect the abalone at all? Well, um, that's their job. But yes, I'm <laughs> trying to restore them. <laughs> what do you mean by collaborating? Okay. I'm not sure. Um, this okay. is just a we'll question that, that came in. We'll come back to it. Okay. Uh, I have abalone clothing and kelp clothing. I'm actually wearing my kelp clothing. Uh, I designed these. They're, they're Indonesian batik. And if you're interested in abalone or Garibaldi shirts or dresses, feel free to ask. The, um, you can send me an email. Uh, I also have collaborated with a local or with a company in Florida called Waterlust that makes sustainable clothing. And they chose the abalone print to, um, it's one of their most popular prints, but every time somebody buys one of their uh, articles of clothing, they make a donation to get inspired for our abalone restoration project. So there's another way you can buy your friends gifts uh, and help support abalone or just talk about it. I am always amazed and surprised that people that contact me, I just got contacted by a researcher in the UK who said, I heard you're working on sargassum. I am a sargassum researcher, and I don't know how he found out about that, but people talking to people, talking to people, talking to people gets to the right people. So tell people about what you've heard and, and tell people about uh, what you care about, and um, that will help me too. So please um, just talk. <laughs> That's something that we all miss doing, talking to one another. So thank you all so much for the opportunity to present to you. And there's all my contact information again, my email address and website and phone number, if you'd like to contact me. And I can take any questions now as well. Yes, I already have a couple. Um, we have one here. Do you think that having an ab fest may encourage poaching? Uh, well, the ab feed, everything is, you know, we, we advertise it, that it is all uh, farm-raised abalone mm -hmm. and, um, I don't think it encourages it. That's already happening. Um, but uh, certainly it does bring awareness to the fact that you can eat abalone. Yeah, I feel like it's something that I've only um, kind of heard about because um, my parents are in their 70s. So it was something that was still really like prevalent when they were younger. Um, but a, longer, a lot of younger kids now, especially the Gen Z, it's not um, necessarily something that they've learned about. Um, or heard about. Um, maybe our Beach City kids, though, um, because they're around. Um, and then I also had a question. Okay. <laughs> so one of our um, board members actually had a, co it's a comment and a question. Um, I can't believe you are able to be so cheerful in the face of the decline of our kelp forests and marine life that are disappearing. Because um, that is like, it's very true. It's such a heavy subject. Um, please tell us a reason to be hopeful 
um, that we can restore our precious marine life. And thank you for your incredible work. Oh, that's a, that's a tough question. Um, I just have a, I've always been laser focused. So I just try to stay focused on my goal. So I don't know how to tell you to be hopeful, quite honestly, except to dial in on something that you can fix. Dial in on something, the, the one thing that you can do. Because there's so many things being thrown at the dartboard right now that it's easy to just turn off and tune out and say, ah, it's too late. So that I try to, I work really hard at not doing that by just staying laser focused on what I can do. Um, and so I forgot, I have one more thing that you can do. Uh, you're not gonna believe this story, uh, but the Department of Fish and Wildlife uh, forgot to put the word restoration in the permitted activities that are allowed in our marine protected areas. They forgot. Hmm. So that means actually if there was an oil spill along one of our state marine conservation areas, we wouldn't be allowed to restore it. So last year I went to go ask for another abalone permit. I haven't done that since 2010 and because my abalone are getting ready to be old enough to outplant. And they told me it'll probably take you three years to get the permit again. So you better start now. So I went to ask for permission and they said, oh, well, you're not allowed to do restoration. And I said, what are you talking about? And they said, well, you all of Orange County is a marine protected area. You can't do restoration in marine protected areas. So uh, I started going to Fish and Game Commission meetings. And so you've asked, am I collaborating? Are they collaborating with me? That's what you should ask. Um, ah. So anyway, started <laughs> going to uh, Fish and Game Commission meetings. And um, finally, I was told every time I'd speak out, Nancy, we can't change that. You have to go through legislation. So after one full year, I now have a bill, AB 63, on the floor of the assembly, the California assembly, to add the word restoration to permitted activities in state marine conservation areas. And you can help by calling your California state senator and telling him to support the upcoming bill, AB 63. Uh, yeah, I had to write a bill to be able to do ocean restoration. Wow. Um, oh. It is amazing what we do in our jobs that we had zero training for. <laughs> so how do I stay hopeful? Uh, staying laser focused. Because oh never did I think I'd have to write a bill. No kidding. Do Although I have to say, like, you are the someone that gives me hope and your work and your projects and the fact that you're also um, inspiring, you know, just as you were inspired when you were in fourth grade by Mrs. May, you're inspiring a new generation of kids that are going to go out and do fantastic things. Um, well, and that's the, that is really my saving grace is I get yeah. to work with people. So even this year during COVID, um, I've had two A students who've uh, contacted me because their teachers know me and they've been my spokespeople. So they've, they've gone to their classes and put on Zoom presentations and created YouTube videos for support of my bill and, um, you know, done done presentations at other schools. Um, so I still get to, to find these very passionate students. And that is what I really love is to, to be able to open the door and work with a student who just needs some doors open for them to, to excel and to run ahead. Um, and this just beautiful story, this one boy who's a sophomore at Los Alamitos High School who contacted me, has done all this work on my bill. He called me, he wanted to be a marine biologist and he called me a month ago and said, you know what, I realize now how important politics is to conservation. And so now I want to be, uh, I want to work in politics. So can you help me get an internship with the, the assembly woman who's helping you with your bill? And so he has an internship now with her. Uh, so there you go. That's, that's how, how you it stay starts home. with kids planting seeds. Um, you never know um, what's going to come of it, but um, usually it's pretty fantastic though. Okay, I have a couple and he's questions. he's got the patience for it. <laughs> it. Yeah, it takes a lot of patience. Um, I certainly wouldn't have that. So, Okay, so are your trained divers still relocating the urchins? If so, how often? No, we, um, we're not allowed because that's restoration. We were, um, we were forced to stop doing kelp restoration in 2012, which was okay because I was almost done with Orange County anyway. Um, but the kelp came back um, more than, we had more kelp than we'd ever had in Orange County in over 30 years. By 2014, it had reached its peak. 
Then we got that blasted warm water blob for two years and then an El Nino and we've lost 90% of the kelp again. But this year was a La Nina. So this should have been the recovery. And I'm waiting until this summer. I, I've just finished my first round of surveys for the year and it does look good. I'm very hopeful that we've seen a great deal of recovery, uh, but there's an aerial survey coming out from Wheeler North's work uh, in August and I'll know for sure how our kelp densities look. That would definitely be good to know. Um, and then, I mean, okay, so since commercial wild abalone fishing has ended, um, it's been done, actually, I don't know, what year did they stop? I mean, even not just commercial, but also um, like individual fishing for abalone. Where? Did you say? It's ooh. different in every, yeah. every place in the state. So Southern California, all abalone take was ceased in 1997. Yeah. Northern California, recreational became illegal in 2017. Commercial take was stopped um, in uh, the early 80s. I'd have to double check when commercial take. No, 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 no. Yeah, I think it was the early 80s. So, um, I mean, has that improved the populations at all? Um, why haven't they made more of a recovery with, um, without people fishing for them? Is it environmental? That's a good question. So there's something called the Ali effect. And when you have something like an abalone that you might, you might have, let's, let's use the United States as a reef, right? You have one male in New York and one female in California. The population's doomed because even though you have a male and female left, they're never gonna make it together. So when you have them too far apart and they have to be within three feet of each other to successfully reproduce and they don't congregate for reproduction, they're just supposed to be a lot of them. So um, the, the minimum viable population for abalone is one per every 54 square feet, which is nine by six. So every nine by six area has to have at least one. Now for a, po a thriving population, there should be about six for every, essentially the size of a smart car. You know, you put that footprint on the reef, there should be six abalone in that smart car to have a successful population. And we're just not at those thresholds. Yeah, so especially with like how long, how, how you know, potentially unsuccessful um, breeding in captivity we're saying can be. It's, That's, yeah, it's very yeah. difficult. That's crazy. Um, and are you, okay, so how are you allowed to do abalone restoration in the Palos Verdes areas, um, in areas that are not marine protected areas? Well, that's where I might have to do abalone restoration if they won't let me in Orange County. Are there any downsides to doing it in areas that are, I mean, not protected as strictly by any kind of legislation? Well, I would love to put them in marine reserves because you can't take anything out of a marine reserve. So yeah. you, know, you don't have any excuses for carrying a bag in there um, and, and bringing anything out. Uh, so that would be the ultimate of protection. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that's going to be allowed. Interesting. And I, I also wrote down that I wanted to mention to you, I'm going to have to ask, I have some family that that's been a tradition for generations. They go to Pismo every year, twice a year. I'm going to have to ask if they have any Pismo clam stories. Um, well, there hasn't been a legal size Pismo taken in Pismo clam and Pismo beach since 1995. Wow. All that clam chowder that ain't from Pismo. <laughs> oh God. I don't know if I want to know where it is from. It's probably from new England. Yeah, they do yeah. farm clams. Yeah. Okay. But, um, but there's, there's a lot of clams there, but they're all little and, the the warden up there told me he wrote 5,000 tickets last year for taking illegal size pismo clams. So you want to know why they never get big? Because everybody takes them when they're little. Yeah, they never get the chance to fully mature, do they? It takes 19 years to get to legal size. And how long does it take um, the green abalone to get to um, like their full adult size? They live to be 30 years old at about 20 years. They'll be full, full size anywhere from 15 to 20 years, 15 to 20 years. Well, I mean, you were right when you told your husband you're in it for the long haul. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. 
And okay, one more question. How can I find out more about joining a volunteer group to help protect the abalone? There aren't any. Mm. You can report poachers. That's, yeah. there's no volunteer group. Just If you see somebody taking it or eating them, or, um, you know, if you find the shells, like I said, with scratch marks in them. Um, I also want to note there's a disease that's going through the population and that's cause it's not withering syndrome, but it's causing them to not be able to hold on. Um, they don't wither, but they get weak. And so I get reports of people finding them upside down, which abalone should never be upside down. If you should see this in the wild, please call me, email me, tell me, because um, I'm tracking this disease and we don't know what it is. Um, but it's been going on for the last two years. Uh, I just like have found a, one last weekend. Wow. Do you know, like, do you have like a point of origin of where it came from potentially or? Nope. That's interesting. Um, oh, you know, I did have one more. I th the, the reproduction was really interesting. Are, is, do they have any similarities to other like land loving snails? Um, are their reproductive processes similar at all? Um, uh, not not from a land snail. They do they do mimic other gastropods, um, other snails in the ocean. So they have the same kind of life stages as other marine snails. Okay, kind of interesting. Sorry, again, not a science expert. So random questions pop into my head, <laughs> and I have one. Okay. I am so honored to hear you speak and find out your role with the kelp. I'm a volunteer docent at Point Vicente Interpretive Center. Oh, Adela, you should um, know Joe Koch then. I actually know him. He's a really fantastic guy. Um, and that's in Palos Verdes. And she tells the story to all the visitors and the children about the disappearance of the kelp and restoration, um, sea otters, um, the urchins, and the replanting kelp. Good. Yeah. Tell the story. Mm -hmm. That's fantastic. That, as you know, I mean, this is a historical society. All of that information is so important. I'm, I'm amazed because when we did kelp restoration in only 2002, um, and they're doing it again now in Northern California, and people say, oh, this is the first time it's ever been done in California history. I go, no, it started in the 60s. What are you talking about? Because people don't know their history. So that's unfortunate because they're also wasting money on trying things we've already done. Uh, but so important for people to know this oral history of, and, and then where to find it. So um, I, all, I go to present, do presentations at science conferences just so people know they can come to me to, to ask questions and get information. It's very true. Um, you never know what inf kind of contextual information you're going to get from a story from somebody or from a photo. Like, again, I pulled this photo up for... Um, somebody in surf rider a couple years ago. And I looked at it and thought, wow, I love the birds flying with here in the background, how scenic. And he was like, no, look at the, look at the kelp on the sand. This is really interesting. Um, but then I'll turn around and kind of say the same thing of, no, I'd love to see your, your family photos on the beach because um, sometimes there'll be a photo of a business or the pier or something else in the background. It may not have been the intention of the photograph or the, when it was taken or the story when it was told, but, um, Sometimes you pick up on these little bits that um, yes. help paint a larger picture, add to your story that you're trying to find on information about. Absolutely. Yeah. So if somebody here um, has any information about, we're looking for Pismo clams, um, abalone. Um, oh my gosh, please share that. That would be absolutely fantastic. And do you have a timeline that someone can refer to, the kelp story, to add dates? Oh. Um. I don't know that there's one that's been written, but I'm I'm happy to share all that with you. If you send me an email, I'll send you a timeline. Okay, awesome. Um, Adela, if you want to email um, the museum, we can get you in contact with Nancy um, or her email is right here. You can email her directly. That's fantastic. Okay, does anybody else have any last minute questions before we let Nancy escape for the evening? <laughs> I don't think so. And I think I got all of mine. I think, yeah, I had all of my notes aside from, I was going to ask you if, if you ever heard of a stellar sea cow, that was like something I became super fascinated with in college. Um, they used to just kind of float around like manatees in the ocean up in Alaska and they are no more. So. Yep. All gone. <laughs> Definitely. Okay, Apparently well, they tasted good too. 
apparently and they were slow moving so they were you know easy pickings um exactly. just, just like the abalone they didn't get away too quickly exactly <laughs> okay so well, the moral of the story is be fast yeah no kidding. <laughs> that would definitely be beneficial especially if you're a marine creature nowadays Okay, well, before I just go down a complete nerdy rabbit hole like you warned us not to do, <laughs> but thank you so much for being here. Um, this was so much fun. Um, I, I feel like I need to go learn more, too. Um, it's gonna have Feel to free happen. to call me, email me anytime. Yes. Oh, and actually, I, I, I absolutely reserve the right to contact you about farming. I'm a huge gardener, so I um, have to okay. call you separately on the side for some tips and tricks. So. <laughs> Well, thank Fantastic. you. Yeah, thank Thanks you for being here. This was so wonderful. Um, everybody, you now know it's on the screen right now. Take a screenshot real quick of where to find Nancy, where to ask her questions and check out her website. You have some fantastic work. And again, you give me hope for the future that, you know, I'll be able to share our beautiful coastal world with our, my generation of kids in the future. So thank you for all of your dedication, <laughs> your hard work, your commitment and devotion. Absolutely fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, everybody. Thank you for being here. Um, have a good night, everyone, and we will see you later, okay? Bye-bye. Have a good night. <laughs>